Today we're going to start talking about gravity. And there, we're going to start with a, a preview and motivation for some more math. <laughs> and then there's going to be a bit of math, uh, defining a manifold, introducing vectors. But then once we have a manifold and vectors, I won't have to tell you anything else about tensors, because you already know how to get tensors from vectors, right? They're multilinear maps, and yeah, they get one forms and tensors, and et cetera. So that's our plan. And let's start talking about a famous idea called the equivalence principle. So the equivalence principle, like many principles, is not as precise as you might like it to be, but it's still very deep and interesting. And there's a few versions of it. <clears throat> One is the weak equivalence principle. And the weak equivalence principle is something you meet already in freshman physics when you learn about force being mass times acceleration. And I'm going to put a little i here on this mass, and I'm going to call that inertial mass. So if you like, this is the mass that's defined by Newton's second law. It's observed that if you take a certain force and you act it on one body, or you take that same force and you act it on a different body, the two bodies behave differently in response. And it depends on a number you can assign universally to each body, mi. And that's the inertial mass, because it has to do with its inertia, its tendency to want to keep moving. And there's another kind of mass you might learn about, which is the force due to gravity couples to the mass. And we're going to write it in the little fancier way as minus the gradient of the gravitational potential. But you can just think of it as minus mm over r squared, if you like. And I put a little g on here for the idea that this is something a little different. This is the gravitational mass. And then the weak equivalence principle is simply that these two are the same. If you're in the presence of an external force, how you respond to that force is the inertial mass. And this passive gravitational mass is if you're in a gravitational field due to some other body. So the gravitational field is sourced by some other body or set of bodies phi. What force do you feel? Well, you have to multiply by your passive gravitational mass. That's the thing that tells you how to convert a gravitational field into the force on you as you move. Okay? And so then what happens is if the external force you're feeling is the gravitational force, then if we write Fg equals m inertial times A, but Fg was also equal to minus m gravitational gradient of phi, the fact that we've decided by the weak equivalence principle, or really it's just observed, that these two are the same means they cancel. And you get an equation, A is minus gradient of phi with no mass at all. Right? And so what this means is the motion of a body in a gravitational field is independent of the mass. In fact, there's nothing in this equation about the body at all, which is, yeah? That's the weak equivalence principle, that these are the same thing. But this is, you know. When you learn this for the first time, you know, Newton didn't think to himself, presumably, oh, these are different, and now we call it a principle and cancel them. Newton just was able to explain things you know, about gravity by putting
putting them in in this way as the same symbol m. So we're just distinguishing them as ideas that are in principle separate in order to show uh, a sort of underlying set of words for understanding the fact that the motion of a body in a gravitational field is independent of its mass. Yes? Yeah, the strong version is basically that this holds even when the gravitational field is strong in the Einstein gravity sense. But the names aren't so important. Uh, you know, they're, they're just different ways of organizing how you might motivate the theory. They're both properties of the theory. Weak field, yeah. So I don't know if you thought anything of this when you first learned about F equals MA and gravitational forces, but the M in F equals MA and the M in the force of gravity on me due to some external gravitational field is, are the same and they cancel. And so the motion of the body doesn't depend on the mass. So the Earth going around the sun, if the Earth suddenly had 10 times as much mass, its motion around the sun wouldn't change at all to leading order and you know, treating it as a, as a point mass which is very different from other forces, right? Most forces, you think it's F equals MA, right? And so you'd say, well, if I got heavier, I'd feel less acceleration for the same force. It's not actually what happens with gravity. You get heavier, you get lighter, it doesn't matter. You feel the same acceleration, OK? Uh, yeah, for falling objects, yeah, Galileo. Supposedly, I don't know if he actually was at the Leaning Tower of Pisa. I, mean, I think not, but you know, he demonstrated that objects of different mass fall at the same rate in the Earth's gravitational field. Uh, so every body, at least sufficiently small compared to the scales of gravity, so you don't have to worry about tidal forces, uh, every body moves the same way in gravity. And, you know, if if I had, if, this, if gravity were the only force in the universe, it would be a little crazy to even introduce this m, right? The equation is acceleration equals minus grad phi. Why did I decide that I should multiply both sides by m and call that force? It's totally unnecessary. But of course, it works for other objects as well, yeah? The gravitational pull of two objects has two m's in it. Uh, but you would only put one m in it. You would put the mass, yes, you would only have the notion of active gravitational mass, how much gravity it creates. But you wouldn't put the second m in it. So you'd still have a notion of mass, you just wouldn't have either of these kinds of mass. So it really looks like a redundancy. Why are we talking about passive gravitational mass and inertial mass? Why do we even have F equals MA when we're talking about gravity? We could get away without F equals MA entirely. And that was one of Einstein's great insights, that gravity really shouldn't be thought of as a force. F equals MA is just not that useful. It just adds a redundancy of our description. It's A that matters. And as Hongji points out, phi, the external gravitational field produced by something else, there there'll be an important notion of mass inside phi. But in terms of the equation for how a body reacts to a gravitational field, which we would normally call force, we see already in Newtonian mechanics that force doesn't look very important or essential at all. So Einstein's big idea is that maybe gravity isn't a force. And that's what we're going to see. We're going to see gravity is, in some sense, just the effects of the curvature of space-time on a body free of force. All right, here's another version of the equivalence principle. I don't know if this one has a name. So E dot P for equivalence principle. This one involves elevators. So you could imagine I'm on the surface of the Earth, but I'm in a box here, an elevator car, if you like, just sitting on the surface of the Earth. And uh, I drop a mass, and I'm going to draw sort of lines above it as if it falls to the Earth. 
that's what will happen, right? But I'm in a box. I don't know that I'm on the surface of the Earth. There's no windows. And um, the other thing I could do is I could put the box in space, so far from any gravitating objects. And I could put a rocket ship on the bottom, rocket engine on the bottom, and I could have this whole thing accelerating. And I'll choose 9.8 meters per second squared. And now I stand inside my elevator car. I'll put a person in here. And I drop my mass. And what happens? Well, you know, we all know from the outside that all that happens is the mass hovers there and the elevator car comes up to meet it and the floor smashes into the mass because of the acceleration. But for all I know, inside the car, you know, I just let it go and it falls down. It's indistinguishable from inside car. I left out the word the because I'm not going to write it <laughs> from inside the elevator car. OK? So this is a kind of um, almost trivial observation once you've done some Newtonian mechanics and thought about accelerating frames. But it's a version of this is what Einstein called the happiest thought of his life because it really led him to formulating the theory of gravity, realizing that you can't even tell if you're in a gravitational field or not. So how would you tell if you were inside this elevator car, whether you were sitting on Earth or whether you were actually in an accelerating reference frame? Yeah, you could talk to, you could use a method of communication that penetrates the barriers of the car, but that's cheating. Let's say you can't use anything from outside your car, elevator car. Any other thoughts? What if you're allowed to do non-gravitational experiments? Then can you do it? How? Oh. OK, that's true. So you could use the magnetic field of Earth. And uh, you could have different magnetic dipoles of different, you know, one up, one down. You could let it go. And you would notice that the magnetic <coughs> dipoles would move differently in the Earth's magnetic field than, than in space. Yeah. But two objects, there is a, a, the, the objects converge with gravity. Right, so that's another way of doing it. If you make your elevator car big enough, you can notice that the Earth's gravitational field is inhomogeneous, right? It points towards the center of the Earth. And so if you have a big enough elevator car that you can see that, then you could drop one object on one side of the elevator car, another object on another side, and you would see that they moved a little bit towards each other, converged. So that's a tidal force. So to make this a little more precise, we should add to our Come on. Sometimes I can make it bigger, but today it won't move. Uh, we should add, so to make this a little more precise, we should add some words. They're indistinguishable from inside car using only gravitational experiments. In gravitational experiments for a sufficiently small sufficient small car. Okay, but that is about as precise and good a principle as you'll get in physics. I think that's a very nice principle. 
So sufficiently small just means whatever experimental precision you, know, you think counts as detecting the fact that the masses actually went towards each other, I'll make the car small enough so you can't achieve that experimental precision. Okay, it's impossible to detect the presence of gravity by purely local experiments. Comments? So this is another way of seeing that gravity really isn't a force. Yeah? Um, if, I guess I'm a little confused about the statement you just made. So you, you're talking about how it's impossible to detect the presence of gravity with sufficiently, like, with local experiments. Yeah. Yet you have put in a caveat in the principle that prevents people from doing that. So why would you, why would that be crucial? Like you say, in add like this is for a car that's sufficient well it's enough. part of the principle I mean it's it the principle has a lot of content because it's not true for any other kind of force so it's absolutely possible to detect magnetism with local experiments you know that was what, what's your name are you a magnetism guy Bennett. <laughs> Bennett I know I knew that so as Bennett pointed out you can detect the presence of a magnetic field using purely local experiments right no matter how small that elevator car is you just release a dipole and you see which way it goes, and you know which way the magnetic field points. So that's very different for gravity. For gravity, I can always make it small enough that there's no experimental precision possible, that you can't achieve a desired experimental precision in seeing that masses go towards each other a little bit. Yeah. Which equation? G M1 G mommy? No, I've never heard that. <laughs> One of the masses cancels out in that equation. If you're working with bodies, well, you. you Okay, so the, whether you can treat a body as a point particle depends on the question you ask. So the, your g mommy equation only applies when you can treat the planet as a point particle. So, you know, if you can't, if you're interested in, you know, the... So if you're interested in Earth's orbit around the sun, you can pretty much treat it as a point particle and use your equation, and then the mass cancels out. Uh, but if you're interested in how the you know, tides affect the ocean on the Earth, you can't. That's a gravitational effect, but it's not described by that equation. It's described by a more complicated you know, set of fluid equations coupled to the gravitational field. It cancels out in every, whenever the g mommy equation is valid, the mass cancels out. And the g mommy equation is valid in a really wide variety of situations, corresponding to the same idea that the Earth is sufficiently small compared to the scales of interest. And so it really is the same idea as the elevator, sufficiently small regions. Okay. Yes? But it gets into these two different aspects. But if like, I simply toss a coin and it's falling down, like, I'm just bringing it close to me. Yeah. So which, I, what other force in gravity would be with it? Like no force. You could be in an accelerating room. How do you know that? I didn't see anything. Okay, but that's non-gravitational. You can't know that just by using the gravitational force. That's why we put you in a closed, that's not a purely local experiment. You're getting photons from outside. That's another way of saying it. So you're closing the blinds. Yeah. <laughs> Shutting the curtains up. Yeah. Is the room flying upwards or is gravity yeah. pulling it down? Yeah. And you know the flat earth people actually believe the earth is accelerating upwards. There are people who believe that. Assume, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Other questions? This is a good discussion. Because like if, there's, if there's one deep thing you learn about gravity, and of course you're going to learn a lot of math and cool things, but this here is the essence of the physics of gravity. It really is. And it, So we're almost to the 
motivation for the kind of mathematical structure we're going to need. But if you buy that you can't tell whether there's gravity or not purely locally, then it's kind of reasonable that gravity purely locally should just you know, disappear into a non-gravitational theory that is the one we've been talking about, special relativity. So general relativity is really just the idea <laughs> that locally near a point, you should have special relativity near an event. And you know, it's not obvious that you should be using space-time, but uh, Einstein's big idea, I mean, I think Minkowski had come up with the idea of space-time already within the context of special relativity. And my understanding historically is that Einstein maybe didn't like that so much at first, but he remembered it. And then when he had these ideas, he figured, oh, well, if special relativity is just flat space-time and general relativity, the theory of gravity, is going to reduce to special relativity locally, well, what reduces to something flat locally? Well, something curved, <laughs> right? We're on the curved surface of the Earth, and it looks flat because we only can see locally. And that, that's really the big idea. So if special relativity is flat space-time, then general relativity ought to be curved space-time. Now, what is curved space-time? Well, we'll have to talk about that, and we'll see that there is an analogy between you know, what you think of as curvature in space and space-time curvature, which is extremely precise mathematically, and how precise physically you view the analogy <coughs> is up to you. But it's so analogous mathematically that curvature is clearly the right word to use. And the picture is that you, know, you have some space, which might be curved. Doesn't look very curved. Let's try that again. Let's do this. This will look nice and curved. OK. So you have some curved manifold, M. We'll define what that means. I've drawn it as two-dimensional, but uh, it's going to be four-dimensional, right? Three plus one. And near a point P, your elevator car or whatever, it's locally flat. And all the whole space we've done special relativity so far is really this little tangent space. So you have special relativity in here and general relativity in here. And so near each point, you just have special relativity. You have an independent little tangent space where you could introduce all the notions we've introduced. And general relativity is about relating physics in the different tangent spaces, basically. It's also about figuring out the curved manifold. But once you have it, doing physics with it is more or less just figuring out how the different little regions of special relativity relate to each other according to gravity. And so that's the non-local. You can figure out you have gravity non-locally by setting up some sort of experiment involving two little regions, like photons coming from another one and so forth. OK? Because the next thing we're going to do is define the manifold and go back into math mode for a little bit. So now is a good time to ask any questions. So the, the key word is sufficiently small. So sufficiently is the, you know, it's always a kind of dialectic. It's, it's, it's like, well, you, your, app, your experimental apparatus, you know, can measure dip, whether two masses are converging to within a millimeter. And I'll make the room small enough that your apparatus will never, that the convergence is less than a millimeter. So you can't measure it. And if you get a more precise apparatus, I'll just make the room even smaller. That's what we mean by local limiting process. And that is a very, I mean, it's, it sounds mathematical, but it is a very physical thing, because ultimately we do experiments with certain precision. It's a statement about experiments. So you have to make your, you know, to make your experiment bigger and bigger to the point where you can detect gravity.
only really one point that's like on the surface, like really on the surface. Yes. So is the boundary of locality just the place where we have a sufficient enough precision that we can do things that are correct enough that are like a circle around that in 2D? Is that you know, kind of the idea? You can visualize it that way, but we are emphatically, so morally, yes, <laughs> but we are emphatically not going to view the tangent space as touching at one point because we want to view our four-dimensional space-time as an intrinsic manifold. It's not embedded in some higher dimensional space that the tangent plane could you know, jut off into and only touch at a point, which is very different from the idea of a two-dimensional manifold embedded in a three-dimensional space where you could really put a tangent plane on that touches at one point. So I agree with everything you said except for the idea of it touching at one point. It's just the tangent plane is just a mathematical object that exists independently of the space. Maybe there's one other comment it's worth making about the attitude change this affects, which is counterintuitive. So um, when we talk about acceleration, so this is a bit of a preview that will, is also uh, good food for thought. So we will define uh, unaccelerated as freely falling. Because you see, you can't ever detect some acceleration due to gravity. You don't know if it's gravity or just an accelerating frame. So it's very, it's, it'd be very annoying if we tried to somehow keep track of how much acceleration was gravitational and how much of it was external. It's not even well defined. So when we use the notion of acceleration, zero acceleration is going to mean freely falling. And that's very different from what you're used to. So if we again put Earth here in two cases, if you're a skydiver, I'll draw you going feet first because I'm not going to try to do any better than that. If you're a feet first skydiver, all right, and so I draw this, you're falling down. This person is unaccelerated in general relativity. No air resistance. There's never air resistance in physics class. That's fluids class. This person is accelerated so it's backwards from what you're used to but think about what these people feel assuming there's no air resistance this guy's jumping from space it's like that red bull stunt where they go way up there if you think about it if you're jumping if you're falling through space and there's no air resistance and you close your eyes you don't know you're falling you feel weightless right you just feel like you're floating it's definitely unaccelerated. If you had a little accelerometer like a spring, it would not compress. Right? Uh, whereas when you step on a spring on Earth, it compresses. <laughs> right? Uh, so that's, you know, or if you're just standing on Earth, you can think of the acceleration as due to the Earth pushing up on you. And that's why it's very tiring to stand. Right? Your feet get tired. The Earth is pushing really hard, preventing you from freely falling, accelerating you away from your natural trajectory. Yep. Mm -hmm. No. I mean, if the observer on the ground insisted on setting up a coordinate system that was stationary relative to him, and measuring acceleration by how much the falling person, you know, d2x dt squared for the falling person, then yes, they would say he was accelerated. But that is not a good notion of acceleration for studying gravity because it relies on the existence of a preferred frame, the Earth. It's totally frame dependent. You're basically defining the acceleration of the coordinate distance between the person on Earth and the person falling 
according to some coordinate system set up by the person on Earth. Yeah, it's, it's a universal, uh, unaccelerated is an easy thing to measure. You bring your accelerometer. You have a blob sitting in a piece of fluid or something, a bubble in a piece of fluid. I don't know. You can do this in different ways. And that, that bubble will just stay there. So you, there's no such thing as position. There's no absolute notion of position. You're thinking about some pre-existing coordinate system that's been set up anchored to the Earth. The distance between the person on Earth and the person falling is definitely changing. That's invariant. But you should say the person on Earth is the one doing the acceleration because you know, she is the one who feels the force on her feet and would measure it with the, an accelerometer. Yeah. It, it took me a second to, to, to like this. But are we effectively going back to like physics one and saying, don't draw gravity on your free body diagram? Yeah. Yeah. And nothing else, so there is a net force pushing him up, and the guy on the right is just yeah. gravity. And no yeah, if, if there were no net force on me, I wouldn't feel so tired standing here. Yeah, yeah, you just the Earth is constantly accelerating me, and my feet get tired. Yeah. Gravity really is not a force. It's, you can solve problems viewing it that way, and in many cases you do. Yeah. But uh, that will not be helpful. In fact, it will end to lead to endless confusion if we tried to keep that in the study of general relativity, because we'd argue over what was the right frame to use. Yeah. So in Newtonian mechanics, we go over this in the same thing. Oh, you draw like a, a normal force, and that's it. You just don't have gravity. Yeah. It's not a force. Usually, we associate that, when you write Newton's second law, we, write, we associate that with motion. Like, for example, if you throw a projectile, and it's uniformly accelerated downwards. Mm -hmm. So. We have to we replace really, Newton's second law. We are, we are mm -hmm. clearly not flying upwards. So. That's right. That's right. And so unaccelerated doesn't mean in any sense that you move straight or stay in the same position. It means you follow a geodesic of the space-time. So our task is to define that. So this pen, when I throw it up and down, is unaccelerated. Of course, it displays some non-trivial motion, which is very important. And a gravitational theory needs to account for its parabolic trajectory. And the way that is done is by noting that space-time is curved, and there's a notion of a geodesic curve, which is like a maximal time curve or shortest length curve, depending on whether you're time-like or space-like. And you know this, that you'll get a parabola out of that. I mean, you certainly can do the Newtonian limit and reproduce every prediction of Newtonian gravity. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. And so my follow-up question then would be the things that aren't understood in physics, like inflation, if there was a system of things which didn't always detract from the gravitational force but instead made it like more, more propelled, would that No, there is, I mean, there is absolutely repulsion due to gravity. I mean, dark energy and inflation, you know, that, but that's a not, it's not a normal kind of matter. You know, it's a matter with negative pressure. Uh, yeah. So if you had that, then you That's a purely relativistic phenomenon. I think you have to view this little preview we did here is starting with Newtonian gravity and guessing how you could derive the full theory. And then the, new, the full theory can make lots of predictions besides those confined to Newtonian gravity, including the possibility of dark energy via a cosmological constant term in the equations or some vacuum energy density or some impliton, which mimics its effects. Yeah. When you mentioned that you listed that you're defining unaccelerated as falling like a straight line in a forward Straightest possible line is one way to describe a geodesic, yes. So unaccelerated is following a geodesic, which is the straightest possible trajectory. It's sort of the idea that, you know, in each of these tangent planes, spaces we set up, you really should be moving straight. Uh, and you, you know, try to 
in some sense, the geodesics are the closest to always just moving straight. I mean, we'll, we'll define that, and hopefully it will make more sense. Some weird connection just happened, and I want to verify it. Is this at all related to the, I, I, this could very well be no, related to the idea of like loose action and sort of optimizing, optimizing a path? Yeah, you can, you can define, derive the geodesic equation by looking for extrema of the proper time functional for time-like. Okay. Yeah, okay. absolutely. So people who like that can do it that way. I'm not going to cover that. I just find the math of it takes us a bit far afield, and I have to give up some physics. But yeah. least action is very important. Anyone interested in continuing physics studies absolutely should study that version, and it's in the book. And you can also ask me at office hours, right? You don't have to just do homework help. Sorry? Least action? No, not locally. Yeah. Local extrema of the proper time functional. OK. Good. So now I've given you enough physics to sustain you while we do the math to make this um, work. <laughs>